Welcome, everybody. My name is Tommy Soros. I'm Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming Hannah Bowman, Principal Scientist at Catalyst. Hannah, welcome to the show. We are so excited to talk to you and hear a little bit about your background, hear a little bit about your adventures in science and what you're doing at Catalyst Pharma Solutions. We are so excited to speak to you. Welcome, Dr. Bowman. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an honor. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so I guess maybe I'll start with, I'm a Purdue graduate. So I have my um, bachelor's in chemistry from, yeah, I graduated in 2010 uh, and then went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison to get my PhD, which is in chemical biology uh, through the chemistry department. So uh, chemistry, chemical biology, right, is kind of uh, the same side of, or the other side of the same coin, I should say, as biochemistry, right? So in biochemistry, we're trying to figure out how does nature in biology, you know, use chemistry, chemical biology sort of flips that and says, how can we use chemistry to influence biology? Um, so a lot of like traditional med chem can fall under chemical biology, those sorts of things. Um, my thesis work was actually on gas sensing transcription factors. Uh, so these transcription factors have a heme on one end of the protein, right, just similar to hemoglobin and yes. under oxygen deplete conditions, they'll actually bind other gases, carbon monoxide, nitric oxide. Um, an allosteric change happens in the protein. Protein binds to a gene sequence, a promoter for a whole pathway, and it basically is the on-off switch then for uh, anaerobic metabolism in these uh, organisms. And it was really, really cool to try to figure out, well, you know, how does all that happen? And so we were using very traditional inorganic chemistry techniques to study the heme of very traditional biochemistry techniques to study the DNA binding and kind of putting that all together. Um, which actually I feel like set me up for, uh, you know, getting my postdoc. So I did a two-year postdoc at Eli Lilly and Company in Indianapolis, Indiana, in their technical services and manufacturing sciences group uh, focusing on insulin. And so I had gotten kind of lucky. Uh, they actually sent an in-person recruiter. They said, we were, we we're going to do on-campus interviews. They were specifically looking for PhDs um, and looking for transferable skills. They, they said, we know you don't learn how to do GMP pharmaceutical manufacturing, you know, as a PhD, but we know that you guys are really good at solving problems. You're really good at looking at complex systems. You're really good at managing projects. That's what we're looking for. We want to bring you into industry. We'll teach you how to do the manufacturing. And so the fact that I had kind of that end to end like experience of I grew my own cells, I purified my own protein, I did my own analytical. I, you know, I think that was really exciting to them. And they said, okay, uh, you have the well roundedness to make a transition, not just to industry, but into manufacturing. Um, right. And so I worked at Lilly for two years. Um, on a, a project I was trying to do some cell line development to see if there was a better way to express insulin. Um, so one of the challenges with insulin, if you're not using a mammalian cell is that it doesn't fold properly. And then that's really inefficient from a manufacturing standpoint. So I was looking at, you know, can I genetically ma manipulate the cells to get the protein to fold within the cell? Um, was, not super successful with that, if I'm being really honest, in the two-year period that I had, but that's okay. Um, that's science, right? But yeah. what it did is it gave me that insight into what it could look to look work, work in a manufacturing environment, and I fell in love with that. So at the end of that postdoc, I said, okay, that's the path for me. I, I want to continue to be in manufacturing. And so that's where I was looking. And through a colleague at Lilly who had worked with another guy who had left Lilly, he had come down to Catalan. I got connected to the role that I eventually hired into. And I've now been in that role, but promoted uh, over the last four years. So I came in as a scientist and I've sort of worked my way up the ladder. That's awesome. And can you tell me, you know, what was that? piece of manufacturing or what was it about manufacturing that you said aha uh -huh, this is what I want to do yeah and so it was 
kind of watching my advisor throughout my PhD struggle with the grind of the grant, right? And the constant begging for money and trying to justify why our research was cool, right? For those of us doing it every day, we're like, yeah, this is fascinating. Uh, for everybody else kind of on the outside looking in, it's sort of like, what? Which, which bacteria are you looking at? What proteins? How, how does that help, you know, everyday people? And it was difficult. It was a stretch, honestly, because we, we, we would make these statements of like, well, if we can understand how it works in bacteria, we can extrapolate to humans and there's implications for circadian rhythm. And, you know, and that may be true someday, 20 years from now, yes. <laughs> but, but yes. that's, that's the challenge of doing basic science. Um, whereas in manufacturing, I am making medicine that goes into people. It's been vetted, right? It's gone through the clinical trials. It's gone through the development. It's gone through the discovery. And I know that I'm having a direct impact and it's not going to die just because somebody at NIH or wherever said, eh, it's not that exciting. We're not going to fund it, right? This, this is really having meaningful impact. And, and that's the part about it that I love. Um, you know, we, we say at Catalan, you know, we have a patient first mindset and I think, you know, I'm able to live that every day thinking about, okay, the decisions that I'm making as a scientist, I can directly impact what the patient is receiving in terms of their medicine. Yeah, that's so powerful. And, and what a responsibility also to take on and, and, and the challenge to make sure that it's consistent time and time and time and time again. Hannah, can you like even explain how a bottle of, of headache medication sits on our shelf at room temperature for so long and it still works even years, maybe decades down the line, it still works and the stability of that, you know. So I'm not going to speak to the headache medicine specifically because I'll say, uh, and I'll, maybe I'll clarify a little bit, right? So in, in pharmaceuticals, we kind of have two regimes. We've got small molecules or oral dosage, right? So those are the pills that you're going to take. Um, so like the headache medicine, right? Your Tylenols, your, your ibuprofens, um, your antibiotics, things like that. Um, but there's a whole nother class of medicines out there that are called biologics. So these are protein-based uh, medicines and those are very powerful uh, because small molecules can only do so much, right? They need to interact with proteins or other you know, biomolecules in the body to have a physiological effect. And you have this teeny tiny molecule against these really big proteins or cells or whatever, uh, there's only so much that they can do. So biologics, you know, the most common form is antibodies, but there are other things out there, enzymes. Um, we're getting really good at engineering proteins where we're taking bits and pieces of different things and you know, putting them together. Now you have protein on protein interactions and, and that's gonna have a much more powerful or profound effect. The problem with proteins is you can't swallow them. Uh, the acid in your stomach is gonna chew them up and nothing is gonna happen. So those types of drugs actually have to be injected into the human body. So it could be an infusion, you know, where you go to an infusion center, um, like a chemotherapy, it could be a uh, intramuscular or subcutaneous injection, you know, like a vaccine. Um, but so everything that we're making at Catalan is protein based in some way, and it's going to be injected as its final dosage form. So how do we make those products stable? I, I can maybe speak to that, right? It's knowing a lot about your protein and what conditions make the protein stable. Um, a lot of work goes into developing what we call the final formulation. So it's the buffers, the salts, the excipients. So those may be uh, some additives that are totally safe for the body, uh, but they're going to impart additional stability to the protein. And then cold chain. So storing these things cold until we need to, uh, you know, thaw them out, maybe dilute them with some saline, like in an IV bag, and then dispense it to the patient. Mm -hmm. So interesting. It's a, it's a new type of pharmaceutical division, wouldn't you say? I mean, we're just getting going with this and, and companies like Catalan are really helping us 
to get it out there in a, in a big way. I know for you and I, it's like, oh my gosh, this has been happening for what, decades now? But for the general public, the people that might be hearing, they might, it might be the first time that they might hear about biologics, it might not be, uh, yeah. but it is a fairly recent new branch of pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, but I, th I think, you know, uh, yeah, it's really taken off though, I would say definitely in the last decade, even, even in maybe the last five years, um, I mean, Biologics is, is the number one seller for, for Catalan, um, you know, and a lot of other companies too, right? You look at some of these multi-billion dollar drugs that are out on the market, things like Humira, Keytruda, Ilea, right? These are all things that probably people have seen commercials um, for on TV. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of stuff now for psoriatic arthritis, you know, with like Cindy Lauper and like these celebrities endorsing it, right? Those are all biologics. Like, yeah, it's huge. Yeah, it's a big, big market. And I just want the audience also to understand that this is where things are moving towards, because as you said, we are limited somewhat by what small molecules can do uh, from a growth a point of views also from what we can do with a patient in the clinic, which is a, it's a very specialized uh, type of pharmaceutical that you wouldn't just have at home. You wouldn't be injecting these things at home, right? Um, yeah. it's, a, it's such an interesting, interesting field. So tell us, tell us a little bit, what do you do? What's your day-to-day -day like? And you know, like, again, like you're thinking in a broad way about the whole system as you're portraying it to us, but your day-to-day -day must be also working with people and, uh, you know, solving problems on, on a daily basis. Yeah, so, um, you know, so you mentioned my, my title is principal scientist, but it's specifically the principal scientist in manufacturing sciences and technology drug substance. So, I'll break down what all of that means. So within biologics, well, and this is actually true in, in oral dosage, but I think the, the difference between the two is even bigger in biologics. So you have your drug substance, which is where we make the actual uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient, right? So when you look at the, the bottle or, or the package, you know, there's that scientific name, you know, and, and so with like the biologics is gonna be something, 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 a MEB. And the AMAB tells you it's, it's an antibody, right? And there, whatever it's called is just that specific antibody. That's what we're making in drug substance. Drug product is then putting it in that final form that the patient sees. So they're gonna take our drug substance, put it into that form, final formulation that I talked about that makes it stable, and then portion it out into vials, syringes, uh, you know, epi, or like not an epi pen, but that's a trademark, but like an auto injector pen, right? Some kind of device to administer um, that drug. So I'm on the side of actually making the antibody, um, nice. which, yeah, which is a six to eight week process, depending on the molecule um, and the process. We have to use um, Chinese hamster ovary cells, Cho cells uh, to and, and we have bigger and bigger and bigger cell culture, but those cells ultimately make the protein of interest for us. So we're not, you know, mixing together a bunch of chemicals the way oral dosage would to make small molecules. Uh, this is actually coming out of uh, living cells. And then we have to purify it because again, it's going into the body via injection. It has to be incredibly, incredibly pure. And so we do a whole series of purification steps. Um, I specialize on that downstream purification side of things. Um, and um, manufacturing sciences and technology are the folks that we call ourselves the stewards of the science. So we are the process experts where I kind of tell people we're tech support for the manufacturing process, not the equipment, not the computers, but the actual science that's happening that gets us from cell culture to active pharmaceutical ingredient. So, on a Without day -day basis. crashing out the protein. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So yes, yeah. we have to think about stability. We have to think about um, keeping it free of, of, of adventitious agents, bio burden, right? We don't, we don't want anything growing 
uh, you know, in our in our process streams. You know, so we work in a clean room environment when we're doing manufacturing, um, yeah. and we're doing this at a fairly large scale. So, you know, our our, our cell culture vessels go up to two thousand five hundred liters. Uh, we're using chromatography columns that are eighty centimeters wide, and you know, for people who are not used to the metric system, I mean, we're talking about you know, I can't even <laughs> put my arms around it. It's that wide, right? It's as tall as I am. Um, so we're, you know, it's big. And yeah. we have a fantastic team of operators that actually have to manipulate the equipment to get all of that to happen. They follow a set of instructions that we call the batch record. My team writes the batch record. So day to day, what I'm doing is I am communicating with our clients. So I'll, I'll mention, Catalent does not really own any of our own molecules. There's, there's a very, very few, um, but, but the vast majority of our business is we are make, doing manufacturing, making medicine for other companies. Um, so, so I have clients that I'm, I'm serving. So I'm in phone calls uh, with the technical experts on the client side. They're telling me how they have previously run their process either at small scale in a lab, maybe at a other uh, contract manufacturing organization like not Catalan, but one of our competitors. Um, you know, maybe they've done it themselves in house. And so they have a lot of expertise and I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do we run their process in our facility? How do I explain these very, you know, technical complex operations to my operators who may only have a high school or basic bachelor's uh, degree. It may not even be in a STEM field and they need to understand then what they need to do, when to do it, how to do it and do it the same way every time. So there's a lot of, you know, distilling down the information and thinking about, you know, how do you communicate that? It, it, it's, it's almost like a teaching role, but but not. There's no grades. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, and so that's it, a big, big part of, of my job um, is that technical transfer piece, the writing of the batch records. The other aspect of it is well, what happens when we're running and something goes unexpected, right? Somebody doesn't follow the instructions that were written, so they got confused. Maybe there's a, a failure in a piece of equipment and something you know, like I said, unexpected happens. We weren't planning on it, right? My team has to step in and go, okay, this is how we're gonna immediately recover, keep moving. And then we're gonna analyze what happened and say, okay, is there gonna be a safety impact to the patient? Because if there is, that batch isn't leaving our hands, right? Um, but if we can determine that there, you know, that wasn't actually a big deal, everything's okay. We, we have to document that very, very thoroughly, show all the work, uh, and then, you know, we can move on. Hannah, it sounds to me like you thrive on being able to handle that piece of translation, because uh, you, you seem to be orchestrating, and it seems like you're doing a lot of that, but there's also a big piece of communication that is happening that you seem to enjoy and you seem to be good at. Uh, can you tell us some of those elements? I mean, what, what makes you e effective? What makes you efficient at communicating? And like, what do you think is that uh, little piece of success there that we could draw out? Well, that, that's a great observation. Um, I don't think I've, I mean, I agree with you, but I don't think I've ever had somebody like knowing them so like for such a short period of time sort of point that out. Um, I mean, I think a big piece of it is empathy, right? And, and reminding myself that I didn't always know all the things that I know, right? That came from time, work, you know, experience, putting in the effort. Um, and some people aren't there yet on their journeys. And so I, I try to avoid being condescending, right? Um, and I try to think about, okay, and, and a lot of it, I mean, it goes back to when I, I taught a lot of freshmen, right? When I was in graduate school, I was a TA for general chemistry. And, and you know, so I was explaining the same material, you know, semester after semester, but the students were changing, right? And so I could kind of, 
experiment and go, you know, that didn't work so well last semester. Let me, let me try it a different way this semester. Oh, that seems to be working. Okay, duly noted. Um, and I can, you know, adjust and move forward. It, it, but that's, that's also what I'm doing at work, right, is, is I'm trying to be empathetic and, and read the audience and try to tailor the communication to, to the individual. Um, because again, some people thrive on the detail. They want to know exactly why, you know, and they want everything spelled out. And there are other people that are like, oh my God, that's so boring. Just get to the point, right? And honestly, it's a learned skill. I've, I've not always been good at it. Uh, it. It has taken practice and time, but the more and more I have, I force myself to do it, to switch back and forth between those modes of communication, the easier it becomes. Yes. And do you find that you have to, not only is the mode of communication different because you're picking a different language sometimes to communicate, but also the amount of detail that you provide one group to another group or the person that you know, ah, you're gonna get bored with the details. Let me tell you exactly where we need to go here uh, and cut to the chase. Does that also play a factor into like, how am I going to address this piece of communication? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and there have actually been times, right, where uh, conflict has arisen, right? Where, because I, I mean, I'll, I'll say, I, I was probably guilty at some point, right? But I've also seen other people, right, uh, stumble with this and pick the wrong, you know, version, and they end up actually hurting people's feelings. And it wasn't intentional, right? Be but sometimes what happens is if you get a lot of people in a room and they, they thrive on the detail and the brainstorming and they, they kind of free th flow the discussion, but you're trying to communicate a, an issue maybe um, or, or a problem, and it's sort of a, an emerging situation, one, one outcome of that can be that the uh, person feels like they're being, you know, kind of jerked around. It's like, well, you guys haven't thought about this. You're here, you are brainstorming in front of me. This looks really unprofessional. Time is of the essence. We need to get down to, you know, business. We're spooling, um, you know, you should have figured all this out. And then, you know, the outcome could have been an email. Why are we having an hour long meeting, right? Or on the flip side, right? You have these people who are very to the point and they're just like, here are the facts. This is what you need to know. I'm moving on. And you get people that, are, that want more of that discussion. And now they're feeling like either that person doesn't care or that they're being brushed off or that they're not, you know, their, that their time isn't important and it's like you know that, that, that they're being treated as an afterthought so it, it's definitely tricky and, and a balance because you know there's, there's a time and a place for everything and it sounds to me like you really have to know how to read your audience know who you're talking to know how to tailor your communication to that particular audience right yeah um, but it but it, those elements and I want to get back to something that you said, because it's something that I think I've been learning also more and more and more is that empathy is the key, even in academia and in industry. We need to have this empathy so that we can communicate appropriately and so that also we can you know, get people to come along with what we want them or need them to do, right? Yep. It's, uh, it, it, it sounds like in every lab, if we have this common level of respect, empathy, as you call that, it, it, it seems like we, we would be able to, um, to maybe communicate better and, and have better camaraderie, collegiality. Do you find there is a big difference between uh, like a, other than, you know, you're, you're working with students in academia, but you're working with colleagues in your lab in industry. Is there a big difference in the dynamic? Um, obviously teaching rather than 
applying and doing? I mean, well, what, and if there is a big difference, what is that biggest difference? Um, I was going to say, with the current team that I'm on, and, and I'll say, right, we don't actually work in a lab. Um, none of us do. Um, my current team is a mix of scientists by training and engineers by training, but we're all on, on one team. We're all sort of working on the same problems. And I, I really enjoy that team dynamic because the engineers have their strengths, the scientists have their strengths, and we bring them to the table. And our team is really great at coming up with creative uh, solutions uh, to, to our problems. And uh, because of that, we, ha we have a really strong bond. I think we have a really uh, trusting team dynamic. We uh, collaborate really well um, as a team. And honestly, I mean, it feels a lot in some ways like grad school, you know, it's like we're all in this together. Uh, you know, there are times when it, it's rough, it's hard, you have the late nights or, or you know, the, the bad group meeting or whatever, and you all kind of, you know, come together and, and <laughs> suffer together, if you will. I don't want to say that like we're suffering every day, but, you know, there's that shared, like, yes. <laughs> you know, we're going through it all together, right? Um, and so that is very similar, but, you know, sort of what is the big thing I think that's different is in industry, there is a lot more hierarchy, right? Um, I'm a principal scientist. I have colleagues on my team that are at a lower title. Day to day, that does, the titles don't really matter, but there are expectations that I'm taking on more responsibility as the more senior person. Uh, I'm gonna be more involved in certain longer term strategic uh, projects or, you know, be given the more difficult client to work with or, or whatever, uh, because I'm more senior. But, you know, I also have a manager, my manager reports to a senior director who reports to another senior director who reports to a general manager kind of a thing. You know, so there's this whole like, you know, tiered system. Um, and, and the responsibility, you know, rises. And the um, the stakes get higher, and yeah. not to say that there isn't hierarchy in academia, right? You have your grad students, you have the postdoc, you have the professor, maybe a department chair, but then kind of after you leave the department, yeah, there's deans and like provosts and stuff. But as a graduate student, you don't really interact with them ever, right? right. Whereas if, me as an individual contributor, I I can skip levels, so to speak, and if I'm having an issue with my boss. I can go to my boss's boss. Or, yeah. you know, if I have a, an idea that's going to impact multiple groups, I can go to the people at a higher level who are now in charge of all of those groups and say, hey, let's all do this together. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in academia, I'm not going to go to the department chair and be like, you know, it'd be really great if all of these research labs, you know, <laughs> harmonized on this thing, right? Like, it's right. not going to happen, right? <laughs> Right. And, and it, I mean, you're right. In the traditional sense, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, there are labs now in uh, academia, right? if I give an example, Purdue, there are labs that are standalone labs that only focus on metabolomics, proteomics, you know, these types of uh, techniques and, and uh, expertise that really require specialized uh, people that can do that stuff, right? Um, and so it's not only within the academic unit, but outside of the academic unit. And we can, we can use those and, and put scientists together through those. But you're right, it's a very different thing than you having this flexibility of being able to put some ideas forward uh, at a higher level and get, get a group of people together. And, you know, this camaraderie or this uh, common toiling of the, the <laughs> responsibilities and the pressures, I mean, that, doesn't that bring you together also because you're like, oh, remember when we had to and that time when that the protein crashed and we yeah. couldn't, you know, like there's so much of that going on that at the end brings fond memories of mm -hmm. we, we really stressed out 
but we made it through the other side and we're still doing it, uh, you know. So yeah. that d- doesn't that also bring people together? And, um, you know, it, and it's a, it, it's, it's a question that I've had is, you know, you know, you know to, to be able to see this growth of life sciences companies here in Indiana, is it that we do have some of this culture where people can work well together and people are are nice and we have an Indiana nice type of culture <laughs> and um, you know it, it it speaks a lot to the cultures in atmospheres inside of our companies, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you want to say something more about that? The culture? Um, or, no. No. I mean, I, I I would agree with you. Uh, um. Good. Um, tell us, Hannah, I, I want to know, you know, as you went from, and you said you were at Madison and you took this position in Lilly, right? Mm-hmm. Is that right? Is that the right yep. um, transition? As you went to Lilly, uh, or as you were leaving academia, was there a, sorry, I think my my audio. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, was you're there, back. Was there a was there a best advice that you got as you were starting in industry or something that you could say, you know, this is something that I really learned that I, I wish I would have known before coming. To um so I don't know I don't know if there was really like a best advice um I know that that transition was kind of seen as um not normal I guess <laughs> uh I'll, I'll try to explain so right a lot of folks, at least in chemistry, right, uh, coming out of your PhD, it's sort of, you end up going into an academic postdoc, or you go straight into industry as a full-time job, right? Um, right. It's very uncommon to do a postdoc in industry. It's, it's not unheard of. Like, obviously, I did it. I was in a cohort of people from several institutions that were hired, um, we had had folks from my lab, you know, previously who had done it, but everybody was sort of like, oh, that's interesting. I don't know a whole lot about that. Um, and one of the things that kept being brought up is, well, well, how do publications work, right? Because if you're in the academic mindset and you're treating this postdoc as a stepping stone to an academic career, it is a bit of a challenge because the work that you're going to do for the company is the property of the company. And there's gonna be a lot of uh, barriers on sharing that, right, uh, outside of the company. And so when you're trying to do job talks and, and talk about, well, what did I do for my postdoc? Well, that's a, that's a secret, <laughs> that's right? right? And, and, and you can't really show a lot of hard data. Um, you can kind of sort of give high level overview of the project, but it, it's, you can't go into it the same way you could if it was an academic postdoc. So, so you do have to keep that in mind if you, if you wanna go that route. Um, I wasn't too worried about that because I was like, well, I'm not seeing this as a way to go back to academia. I'm seeing this as a stepping stone into industry, uh, but I still kind of had that challenge, right? Because when I left that postdoc and I was applying at other companies, some of them wanted me to do a talk and they wanted me to talk about the postdoc. And I'm like, well, you're a direct competitor of the company I'm currently working for. I really can't talk about it, you know? Right, um, right. And, and, and I think that that honestly hurt me a little bit in, in my job search coming out of the postdoc. Um, Catalan didn't require me to do that kind of presentation. So I think, you know, that worked to my advantage. Yeah. Um, so so that, was, that was kind of one of the things, you know, I was sort of warned about and I was like, eh, <laughs> you know, and it still kind of ended up being true. Uh, but the other huge takeaway that I took from that postdoc 
uh, well, two of them. One of them was the communication, right? That was really the testing ground for the communication piece that we've already discussed. Um, you know, really putting that to the test and finding out that I was sort of lacking and I needed to do better. But the other thing was a, was actually a technical tool. Um, I got really into statistics and specifically the de design of experiments, which is a, a statistical methodology. Like when everybody that I've ever like talked to who, who has come out of sort of a traditional academic uh, chemistry type PhD, you, you hear design of experiments and you're like, well, duh, I can, I can design an experiment. I mean, that's why I went to grad school. I got a PhD, right? And so, no, 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 no. This is a, a very specific <laughs> way of setting up the experiment to do the math to, to get uh, understand your results. Yes. And as I, I'm no glad that you're- No T-test, no yeah. T-test, please, no yeah. T-test. Yeah. No, 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 not just T-test, okay? Yeah. We're not, not going to use Excel for this one. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. but no, yeah. no. Right. I know. But, but, but going through all of my schooling, that was I was never exposed to that. That's not part of the standard curriculum for a chem major at Purdue. Yeah. It is if you're a chemical engineer, not if you're a chemistry major, right? And, 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 you know, at UW, again, in the chemistry department, nobody's using this. You go over to the engineering school, absolutely, right? Or if you go to a lab where somebody worked in industry and came back, they may bring that with them. But right. that was mind-blowing to me and getting that training. And I was like, oh, my gosh, if I had known this <laughs> <laughs> at the beginning of grad school, I probably could have shaved a year off of, of yep. my PhD because I would have been setting up my experiments differently and I would have been so much more yeah. efficient. Yes, so. I agree. I agree with you, Hannah. I think there is something to be said about statistics in general for any scientist. I don't care if you're a biologist or a chemist or a biochemist. Uh, I, I really think there is a real good need for uh, any scientist to learn not only the mechanics of statistics, which I got burned, and I, I sympathize with you because I got burned uh, giving a presentation not knowing my statistics, and that was the turning point for me to say, I will never do a scientific presentation without knowing my statistics well, and that that led me down a path of, you know, learning and knowing statistics. In fact, I, I, uh, I was working with a plant breeder at that time, and you can imagine the genetics and stats that, th that these breeders do. But anyway, it's an incredible tool, and I thank you so much for mentioning it as, a, as, as something that people should think about if you do want to do science, regardless of industry or academia, having statistical knowledge is great. And not what I mean is not just the mechanics of knowing how to calculate an average or knowing how to, you know, do a test for outliers, but what does that really mean? And how do you do it? And how, like, how does it work? And because it is a great, great tool to have. Um, Let's go back for a second to your postdoc in industry. Most of us from academia are used to postdocs in academia. But this point about not being able to publish or it taking a longer time and you not being able to present about your work seems to be like something definitely to, to consider uh, for somebody who is thinking about this. Are there positive aspects of the postdoc in industry that you would be able to say, well, no, I really liked it because of this and I would have still preferred to do that postdoc in industry rather than stay in academia and do a postdoc in academia. Well, like I said, you know, for me, I, at that point, I had pretty much made the, dis the decision that I didn't want to go to academia. Um, and, and so it still made a lot of sense because even if I couldn't, you know, give details, it was still two years of industrial experience that I could put on my resume um and and say well you know i can't really talk about it too much and and again the the other industrial companies right they understand that right uh, so yes. the, it's like they want you to talk about it 
because they want to see that you can present. I think they could be a little forgiving and say, you know, we understand that there's non-disclosures and IP and all this, uh, but um, even still, like even if I thought maybe I would go back, it was still very valuable because, well, one, <laughs> doing research in, in, in a lab or in a space that is fully equipped where you're not you know, scrimping and, and trying to like, you know, cut costs wherever possible is, it's a really uh, breath of fresh air, I'll say, right? And maybe it'll spoil you and you won't ever want to go back. But I think having that experience of like, oh, this is what it's like to do research when the equipment is there and it works. And I'm not the one who has to like duct tape it back together, um, right? There's a team of professionals who it's their sole job to calibrate those pipettes and those scales and, and whatever, and make sure that they're working um, is nice, right? And to be able to buy the high grade raw materials um, because that's the right thing for the science that you're doing and getting those like results, it's, it's very validating. And because now you're saying, well, okay, maybe some of my struggles in grad school wasn't me, it's the environment, right? And so there's that, <laughs> right? But then there's, there's the people aspect of it too. It's working in that other environment, working um, in, you know, within that hierarchy, working within the regulations. And, and again, I was in manufacturing. There's a much higher level of scrutiny to the, to the work that we're doing um, and the documentation that's required. Um, you know, that you, so you may have been like, yeah, my lab notebooks are fine. Fine until you really actually have to have somebody second person verify and, and they're, no, 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 <laughs> this is incomplete. That was wrong. Um, you know, those sorts of things and, and having to have that, that record, you know, you, you learn from that. Um, I said, you learn how to give presentations differently I love giving academic presentations because it matches my like communication style that I prefer, which is to get into more of the details and, and really kind of nerd out about the topic. But, you know, having that ability to do the 30 second elevator pitch, right? Uh, to, to, to really drill down to something, get to the core of it. Uh, say, this is the problem. This is what I'm gonna do to fix it and move on. You know, that's very valuable. And I think, you know, taking that back to an academic setting would really serve a lot of people well. Um, I kind of make this like joke, but it's half serious. You know, there's a lot of academics that I've met, great people, don't get me wrong, but they would have a hard time if they had to work in an environment that had HR. <laughs> and it's not to say that universities don't, but it's, it's very different <laughs> than, than, you know, in, in a company. And so, yeah, like I said, just, just learning how to work with other people where the rules are more strict, it feels weird at first. But then I think once you get used to it, that you're like, oh, this, this actually helps. And then to go back into like a, an academic lab setting and say, okay, I understand a little bit more about how to manage upwards, right? I can manage my PI, you know, if you're in that situation, or I can manage the department chair now that I'm a professor, because uh, that's something I learned how to do in industry. Right, right. And you, th so you would totally recommend somebody to look into a postdoc in industry if they have it. Yeah, and it, I would say it doesn't even have to be a, a true postdoc, if you will, but I, I would say if you really are not, you know, 110% confident, like I am being a professor, like if you're, if you're just looking and you're just like, you know, I, I need something for the next couple of years to kind of get to that next step because I need the extra experience, don't discount going into industry. Like I said, it doesn't have to be a formal postdoc program, but go do that. Work in industry for two, three, four years. And if you love it, great, stay. If you hate it, then, then maybe try to go back to academia. Right. right. I think you're going to have a bit of a challenge trying to explain how those two to four years is equivalent to an academic postdoc at some right. institutions, in some departments. But I still think, you know, you were still doing independent science, right? right. 
uh, away from your PhD advisor. Um, and, and you could probably still have some kind of deliverables to show, even if it's not papers, you still may be able to say, well, you know, I was on this project and I did X number of syntheses or, you know, optimize this process and got a you know, 30% reduction in the cycle time or whatever. And again, this is, I'm sounding very in industry right now, but that's, that, that, those are selling points, right? And I think that, that shows people like, hey, you know what you're doing. <laughs> right, right. That's, that's awesome. And, and, you know, I think as we go along, as, even as you said, had I known this was available to me, I would have done my PhD a year ahead of time or whatever. I would have completed my projects way quicker. Uh, that's available now right mm -hmm. and and it's incredible too just how at, at what levels the scales of data that you're accumulating for building a phd thesis those levels are also increasing right and mm -hmm. and what what we're trying to to uh to do to create efficiencies there but it's so interesting this uh, move that an inspiration that you got to know and and to have also the eye that you want to be in this latter part of the manufacturing process which it sounds to me like you're passionate about that because you get to really make an impact as like the final pass through here it is we're i'm doing the handoff and it's and it's me tell us hannah does it keep you up at night though knowing that that's a great responsibility that you have as well uh but knowing that it's it's a wonderful uh honor to to be able to have that responsibility and, and to do really congratulations on the success that you've had to be able to reach there and, and to do that. The, re the responsibility that you have, I'm sure the company doesn't take lightly, right? It's, uh, it's an incredible one. Well, yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah, there are times, right? When in the, in the especially, when we're responding to immediate issues, you know, where you, you, you think about it and think about it and go, you know, did I make the right call? You know, should I have done something differently? But, you know, I think the thing that makes it okay at the end of the day is it's not just my personal responsibility, right? I, I have input for sure, but it's never my sole responsibility. It's a team effort. Um, and I have the back of my team and, and the teams that support my team, um, you know, to have those difficult conversations with senior leadership, with the client and say, look, no, there is fundamentally a problem here um, and, and we need help overcoming it. Um, you know, or we may actually have to to reject this batch. Like we're not going to make money on this batch because it is not fit for for human use. Um, I mean, I've 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 been through those conversations and they're not fun. But again, at the end of the day, you're saying I would a hundred times out of a hundred rather make the call to to reject the batch. Uh, and just have a financial impact than I would to say, well, did I do the right thing and say that that batch was okay? And then, you know, somehow find out later that patients were actually impacted because we made the wrong call. So we're always going to err on the side of caution um, and, and really do our due diligence. And, you know, if we think that there's a way to save it, we'll, you know, we'll explore it. But again, it's never going to be one person's call to make. It's going to be a team effort. Yeah, absolutely. And and it it sounds like again you you enjoy that uh that culture, you enjoy being in that dynamic with the team. Um you also told us that uh Catalent doesn't own or doesn't have a, a, a ownership in any of the molecules that you guys are are making you guys are solely a manufacturer of molecules and i think i want the audience to understand that difference that there are pharmaceutical companies that actually develop the 
the molecules, be the biologicals or small molecules or whatever, but then you guys are responsible for uh, manufacturing and scaling up what they've done in a smaller scale. And boy, oh boy, things don't really act the same when you're dealing in a couple of microliters <laughs> on a test tube than when I'm making gallons uh, in Cho cells. Uh, my gosh, that, that, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, your your microphone's gone again. About that? That's better. Yeah. yeah, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening with my headphones. It keeps uh, knocking me out. But such an incredible transformation from going to from the lab test tube to these large vats and as you said i mean we're used to seeing the little columns that you put on the hplc you know they're they're very nice and small but you're talking about a huge tube where you mm -hmm. have to push these things through um the dynamics of that must be so exciting eh? yeah and and that's that's the absolute best part of my job because I mean that is just fundamental problem solving at its purest and and the science and you know I, I don't mind being client facing actually there, there's some parts of that that I really enjoy as well because I kind of feel like you know I'm in the room where it happened so to speak and, and having influence and being able to help the client make decisions but the the nitty gritty of doing technical transfer where you're just looking at how does this scale doing the exercise on paper and, and making sure that you've got it as good as you can so that when we go to run it, it's going to be safe. It's going to, you know, work and then it works. And it's like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <Yeah. laughs> right on. And again, like just so that everybody understands when you're talking about your client, you're talking about a pharmaceutical company that mm -hmm. developed this thing. And now they're asking you to make boatloads so that we can distribute them around the world, around the country and so on. Right. Yeah. Um, and that but how, uh, how what a wonderful um, I, a process to be a part of. And, and Hannah, again, I can see why you, you have been so successful is because you, I see that excitement in your eyes when you're talking about it. And, and it's great to be able to pass that on to everybody else that's listening and watching this because, you know, you've said a few things that are very key in a company, the quality of the reagents, the quality of the instrumentation, everything you're working with is up uh, top notch. And the, maybe the frustrations that sometimes you do get in academia is because you think you're running a, a stampede race here, but you're in a little bit of a mule here riding around <laughs> yeah. the thing, right? Uh, rather than, yeah. the, you know, a big thoroughbred uh, horse. <laughs> yeah. that's, uh, and that, that is also the difference, but also the, this whole process of, of being able to see that there is a, a cultural difference in maybe it is for the people that are watching and that can get excited about the things that you're getting excited about because i tell you what you're you know it, it like it you you're impacting me and i i get it, I, I really i'm i'm thinking about these things i'm like hmm, i need to come down to bloomington and visit you guys because i really want to see this lab and i want to i want to see what it's all about and you know it's it's incredible if you haven't had the opportunity um to to understand how that happens at an at an industrial scale is wonderful i I thank you so much for uh, letting us peer a little bit into that world and also being honest because you, you know, I know you, you're representing Catalent and, and, you know, the, the, the things that, that you're saying are very much personal and they don't really represent the company, but here you are, you're telling us a little bit about how it works and, and what, what motivates you to continue to succeed. If you were going to give advice to somebody that was 
looking into opportunities at Catalent or looking at opportunities uh, for life science companies here in Indiana, what would you say to them? What, what, what are things that would attract them? Um, hmm. So, I mean, I guess the first thing would be to keep an open mind. Um, and I think, you know, uh, uh, people with PhDs, it's a little bit of a different situation, right? So I don't necessarily need my PhD to do the job that I am doing currently. Um, many of the folks on my team do not have PhDs and that's doubly true, right, of the engineers. It's just not super common for folks to go all the way to the PhD level in engineering. Um, but it did help me sort of get through climbing the ladder faster and, and catching on quicker, I, I will say that. Um, but especially if you're if you're listening to this and, and you aren't going the PhD route or you're not sure if you're gonna go the PhD route, definitely keep an open mind because I think a lot of times we think, oh, I'm a scientist, I have training in the sciences. The role that I should be taking is scientist, right? And while that is in my title, it's really just acknowledging what my academic background is. It doesn't really speak directly to the work that I do day to day. It's that manufacturing sciences and technology piece that really says this is this is what I do. And, and so this is all to say, right? You may box yourself in if you're doing keyword searches on you know, Catalan's careers webpage or Indeed or LinkedIn or whatever, and think, oh, well, I'm a scientist, so I can only work in a lab. So that's gonna look like process development. That's gonna look like quality control. But there are many opportunities to use your scientific expertise and those problem solving skills in a new way, right? You can look into quality assurance, right? Which is, those are the folks that make sure that we followed all the rules and that the product's gonna be safe it's super helpful to actually understand the basics of chemistry and biology, because when you're looking at an executed batch record, you understand what was happening out on the floor, right? Um, you could look into validation. Validation is basically the fancy industry term for the scientific method at scale. <laughs> um, I mean, I could do a whole nother talk about that. Um, <laughs> you know, So you need scientists and engineers to do validation regulatory. Uh, affairs, right? It, it's looking at, again, sort of the law side of, of the, the compliance, right? What, why does the FDA, why does the federal government say we have to do these things in order to be compliant? Well, you have to understand what those things are. Um, so, you know, then, like I said, you have manufacturing sciences. The, the role at another company might be engineer. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have like your PE, like be a professional engineer, it could just mean that's the type of activity that you're doing. So I guess I'm just saying, be open-minded, get some creativity in your, in your keyword searches and really look at those job descriptions and say, hey, uh, if they're just requiring a STEM degree, but these tasks that I would be doing sound interesting and, and play to my strengths, go ahead and apply. Uh, and you might just find something uh, that, that you like and you enjoy that you never thought was actually possible. I mean, that's basically what happened to me, right? I never, when I started my PhD, I didn't think, oh yeah, I wanna do, do manufacturing. Like I said, it was only when that option was presented and said, hey, you would actually be qualified for this. I was like, okay, I'll give that a try. And then I fell in love with it, right? So that, that would awesome. be the number one thing. Awesome, awesome. I, that's great advice. Great advice, and I hope everybody is listening to that, being flexible, opening also other word choices to use, keywords to, to search for. Dr. Hannah Bowman, I thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. Uh, Principal Scientist at Catalan Pharma Solutions in beautiful Bloomington, Indiana. Um, yeah. I hope- The other I, side of the city from you know that school down south. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, and we really thank you so much for uh, just giving us uh, so much great information. And uh, I know this video is gonna be watched by several. Uh, give us a like if you can. And uh, thanks again, uh, a pleasure speaking to you today.
Yeah, it was absolutely an honor to be asked to do this. And yeah, thank, thankful for the opportunity. Absolutely. Be well. Speak yeah. to you soon. Yeah, you too. Boiler up.